Welcome to Morning Seminary. I'm your host, Simeon Sideways, and in this podcast, we'll explore some of the teachings of the Book of Mormon, a strange book published in 1830 that Mormons claim is a historical account written by people from an ancient world. For now, let's ignore the Book of Mormon's mentions of horses, elephants, chariots, silk, steel, wheat, and all the other stuff that didn't exist in pre-Columbus America, or even how author Joseph Smith tried to sell the copyright to a fiction publisher. We are here to read some stories together. Nobody likes being told what to do, especially when it goes against our own best interests. When governments or people in power obstruct the freedom of others, we call it oppression or abuse of power. It's obvious when we're the victims to it, but things get interesting when we're accused of doing it to someone else. No one wants to be the bad guy, so our brains mold reality to avoid self-incrimination and keep us from confronting unpleasant or life-altering truths. Are we the baddies? Nowhere is this more true than with power and material wealth. As staples of security and peace of mind, acts that disrupt someone's cash flow or question their authority, even when it's for a good cause like preventing starvation and disease, are attacked, dismissed outright, or even viewed as acts of oppression themselves. As a person's levels of wealth increase, their feelings of compassion and empathy go down. That was Paul Piff, a psychologist who studies how wealth affects human behavior. He makes a point most of us already know. When things are on the up and up, people identify less with the poor and take credit for their good luck. He also makes another point. The wealthier you are, the more likely you are to pursue a vision of personal success to the detriment of others around you. When the oppressed speak out or fight for justice, those in power can frame their resistance as the real oppression. There I was, minding my own business, when out of the blue somebody ran their face straight into my fist. I had to defend myself. History is full of examples where one group targets another and forces them to either capitulate, retaliate, or just die. The genocide of indigenous peoples in America, the Haitian slave revolt, Internet Explorer, the list goes on. Rather than feel remorse for their crimes against humanity, the victorious oppressors take heart that their righteous ideals led to the triumph of good over evil, man over beast, freedom over bondage, and the losers immortalized as perfect obstacles to lasting peace whose savagery could only be conquered by the might and courage of the righteous. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. In this episode of Morning Seminary, we're talking about the Kingmen, a group of rebels who were unhappy with the ruling government and decided to revolt. Their timeline is short and their loss bloody, but their impact remains today on Mormons who see any system of government other than red, white, and blue as wicked and tyrannical. We must not tolerate accommodation with or appeasement toward the false system of communism. We're back in Zarahemla, that big, righteous Nephite city, and people are thriving, at least the believers are thriving. And thus they did prosper and become far more wealthy than those who did not belong to their church. Right off the bat, Alma brags about Zarahemla's wealth gap to show how God favors the believers and ignores everyone else. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. The have-nots, fed up with this prosperity doctrine, decide to rise up in revolt, led by a guy named Amalekai. His supporters band together as Amalekites and hold rallies to make Amalekai king. The Book of Mormon never really tells us their rationale. I mean, it makes sense to me. They felt unrepresented by a government they presumably paid taxes to. But the Book of Mormon only paints a vague picture of people foaming at the mouth to forfeit agency and consolidate power to a single central region. They participate in a vote with the people of Zarahemla. Amalekai loses, though. So having tried and failed to improve life through democracy, the dejected Amalekites resort to violence. This is the maddest I've ever been! Which turns out to be a huge mistake. The Amalekites are beaten back and run away, but the Nephites, ever a peace-loving people, decide to wipe them out completely. And the Nephites did pursue them, and did slay them until they were scattered, 
and many died in the wilderness of their wounds, and were devoured by those beasts, and also the vultures of the air, and their bones have been found and have been heaped up on the earth. Tens of thousands slain as they retreated, says Alma. No mercy. They are wiped off the map. Then, a couple chapters later, another huge band of Amalekites appears. Somehow Palpatine returned. This band of Nephite-led Lamanites comes from the city of Ammonihah, and they too want a king, just like before. Again the insurrection is put down, and again it's described in gruesome detail. Yea, every living soul of the Ammonihites was destroyed, and the carcasses were mangled by dogs and wild beasts, and so great was the scent thereof, that the people did not go into the land for many years, and it was called desolation. Not long after, the Lamanites that Ammon from episode 3 couldn't convert are riled up again by the Amalekites, going off to fight the Nephites for a third time. We've been here before. We're going in circles. Throughout the Book of Mormon, the Lamanites are mostly throwaway characters, a brainless horde of bloodthirsty savages who don't ever think for themselves. They don't choose to fight so much as are chosen. What is it? What do you smell? Man flesh. Despite having a massive army, this Amalekite insurrection is also put down. And again the Amalekites rile up the Lamanites, proving that it's not how many times you get knocked down, but how shamelessly you can tell the exact same story verbatim. But it might work for us. The Amalekites are slaughtered, of course. Now the number of their dead was not numbered because of the greatness of the number. Innumerable bodies and unbearable stench all about 150 years before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, according to the timeline. No, there's no evidence of these wars. Yet. A fifth f***ing Amalekite appears named Amalekiah. Joseph Smith got real creative here. And can you guess what Amalekiah wants? That's right, lasting peace. Just kidding, he wants to be king. So he schemes his way into the Lamanite throne by killing their king and marrying the queen. Didn't know we had a king. I thought we were an autonomous collective. You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship. Our story begins here, at disgruntled Nephite upstart number five. By the way, it's been just 20 years since the first insurrection we covered. 20 years! During which time the Lamanites fall for five identical Nephite schemes that cost them countless soldiers. Why can't the Lamanites govern themselves? Will they ever learn to fight a battle and win? Will Nephite foreign policy ever stop the Lamanites from attacking them? Like the others, Amalekiah tries and fails to besiege a city in Zarahemla. Unlike the others, however, he survives, and swears to drink the blood of the general who bested him. But this is no ordinary general. No, this is the greatest military mind in the Book of Mormon. It's Captain Moroni! And Moroni was a strong and mighty man, a man of perfect understanding, who did not delight in bloodshed, whose soul did joy in the liberty and freedom of his country. Yea, if all men had been like unto Moroni, behold, the very powers of hell would have been shaken forever. Well, I'm aroused. I posted some Moroni fan art on the Morning Seminary Instagram in case you want to see how hot he was. Captain Moroni doesn't show up until Alma chapter 43, so up until now the Lamanites were only slaughtered in passive voice. And they had many battles with the Nephites in which they were driven and slain. Anyway, Captain Moroni puts in work to fortify the lands of the Nephites, building walls, moats, and watchtowers for the next Lamanite attack. And along with the added protection, all this expansion earns the Nephites more wealth. And they became exceedingly rich, and did multiply and wax strong in the land. We have the fastest growing economy in the world. The world. For about three years, the sprawling Nephites are happier than ever. They have a democratic republic, aka court of judges led by a guy named Pahoran. A government starkly different from contemporary Mayan civilizations who believed their rulers were omnipotent gods. This is where things start going wrong. Some Nephites from the city of Morianton, led by a guy named Morianton, decide they want to go up to the land called Desolation. 
Yes, that desolation. The place no one wants because it reeks of death. For some reason, Moroni intervenes to stop their migration and send them back home. They're not happy about it. Part of the people desired that the law should be altered. But behold, Pahoran would not suffer the law to be altered. He did not hearken to their petitions. Come here. No closer. I don't make deals with peasants! This part of the people mentioned here is the Kingmen, a frustrated group who, after seeking remedy through democracy and being told no, rally to replace Pahoran with a king. There's a vote in Zarahemla, and the Kingmen lose. But unlike the Amalekites earlier, the Kingmen don't incite violence. And they durst not oppose, but were obliged to maintain the cause of freedom. Obliged to maintain freedom. Got it. Unfortunately, the timing is terrible. Amalekiah, the guy who wants to drink Moroni's blood, has riled up the Lamanites again and is now marching on Zarahemla, uprising number six if you're still counting. Moroni badly needs soldiers, but the disgruntled kingmen aren't all that eager to fight for the government that just ignored them. This pisses Moroni off, so he tells Pahoran it's time to do some killing. And it came to pass that Moroni sent a petition desiring to compel those dissenters to defend their country or put them to death. With the Amalekites at his doorstep, Moroni opts not to march his armies against them, but against the kingmen, 4,000 of whom he kills before the rest beg for mercy and suit up for war. Please don't kill me, man. I'll give you anything. I give you all the money I got. I give you everything. I... With the kingmen neutralized and not at all a ticking time bomb, Moroni turns his attention back to the Amalekites. Because they are light-skinned Nephites, the Amalekites mark their foreheads red to distinguish themselves from Moroni's army. This is something the Lamanites don't have to do because God cursed them with dark skin. I just had to throw that out there in case any Mormons say Lamanites weren't necessarily dark-skinned. They will, by the way. Amalekiah's army takes the rural cities of Zarahemla, but before they can do any more damage, one of Moroni's lieutenants slips into the Amalekite camp and puts a javelin through Amalekiah's heart. Moroni then takes prisoners and puts them to work reinforcing Nephite defenses. Amaron, the late Amalekiah's brother, takes command of the Lamanite army. Having a few Nephite prisoners to exchange for his own, he sends Moroni a request to do so. But he's also got some other stuff to say. Arr, your fathers did rob their brethren of their right to the government which belonged unto them. And if ye lay down your arms, matey, and subject yourselves to be governed by those to whom the government doth rightly belong, then my people shall lay down their weapons and be at war no more. Well, that does it for Moroni. He backs out of the prisoner exchange deal. Nothing like offering the same terms as your enemy to piss him off. I mean, listen to this zinger from Amaron. Aye, if there be a devil in the hell, will he not send you there also to dwell with my brother whom ye have murdered? Expansion like the kind in Zarahemla doesn't happen without extracting finite resources from resource-rich land. And Nephite-style colonialism acquires that land by taking it from the Lamanites, either by force or by religious conversion. Missionary work is colonialism. We are the army of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The government policies of Pahoran excuse as natural law the fact that the Nephites' wealth correlates with the Lamanites' poverty which is why Moroni never stops to ask why they feel cheated. To him, Lamanites are just bad, lazy people. Killing countless numbers of them is just self-defense. We don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> Following Amaron's letter, Moroni hatches a plan where he uses a faithful Lamanite to pass as black and deliver wine to Amaron's army so they get drunk. Once they pass out, the Nephites arm the prisoners, steal the Lamanites' weapons, and surround them. Thwarted again. No! With their army whole again, the Nephites start taking their cities back at breakneck speed. Everything is going incredibly well. Heck, they might make it out of this in one piece. But then disaster strikes. Supplies from the city of Zarahemla are grinding to a halt. Moroni's army is running out of food. And despite numerous requests for assistance, Nobody's answering. With his soldiers starving to protect the city, Moroni writes a nasty letter to the gutless Pahoran condemning his unwillingness to defend his own city. 
can you think to sit upon your thrones in a state of thoughtless stupor while your enemies spread the work of death around you? Except ye administer unto our relief, I come unto you and smite you with the sword. Once again, Moroni, a man who does not delight in the shedding of blood, issues a death threat when things don't go his way. No diplomacy, no voting, just death. After what feels like an eternity, Pahoran writes back. It's the kingmen, he says. They have taken over Zarahemla and established a king. So Pahoran had to flee. I, Pahoran, do not seek for power, only to retain my judgment seat that I may preserve the rights and the liberty of my people. They would not shed the blood of the Lamanites if they would stay in their own land. We would not shed the blood of our brethren if they would not rise up in rebellion and take the sword against us. That's not true, though. The kingmen didn't take up the sword, and Moroni executed them for it. And he threatened the Amalekite prisoners the same way. And whomsoever of the Amalekites would not enter into a covenant to support the cause of freedom, he caused to be put to death. And there were but few who denied the covenant of freedom. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Now caught up on why his soldiers are starving, Moroni shreds his coat in anger and scrawls the following on it. In memory of our God, our religion, and freedom, and our peace, our wives, and our children. He then posts it throughout Zarahemla to recruit whoever he can and march back to town. The freedom-loving patriots march into Zarahemla and track down the would-be king and his followers. There's a skirmish, and Moroni kills the democracy extinguisher. Freedom wins. Everything goes back to normal. Phew. Crisis averted, huh? Could have been a real bloodbath if the authoritarians had their way. People getting murdered for speaking out or refusing to fight for a government they don't sup- Wait. For a man who doesn't delight in the shedding of blood, Moroni sure kills a lot of defenseless people. I mean, imagine if Amalekiah had killed political enemies the way Moroni killed the kingmen. Madness. But that's the thing about God. If he's on your side, there's nothing to worry about. Whatever God requires is right, said the prophet Joseph Smith. One word for this thinking is jingoism, an idea inspired by a British war lyric that reads, we don't want to fight, but by Jingo, if we do, we've got the ships, we've got the men, and got the money, too. No matter how bloodthirsty our actions may be, the motivations of God-fearing people are never as bad as the bad guy's motivations. They're bad. They do bad things, whereas the good guys are good, so whatever they do is good, even if it's worse than what bad people do. Jingoism sets the table for oppression by spreading fear about conflicts down the road. If we're not in control, it's only a matter of time before we're under someone else's control. Better to carry the big stick than be struck by it. In 1839, John O'Sullivan wrote about the United States' divine destiny to spread values like equality, rights of conscience, and personal enfranchisement in an effort to, quote, establish on earth the moral dignity and salvation of man. Manifest destiny, America first, God bless the USA, fortune favors the brave, the title of liberty. They're all slogans that excuse the collateral damage of empire by applauding the spirit in which it's done. It's not the critic who counts, said Teddy Roosevelt, but he who strives to do the deeds. Mormons see welfare as a tyranny thing because it takes away your agency. For this episode, I got to speak with Nick from Unsettling Mormonism, one of my very favorite Instagram pages, about how stories like Captain Moroni parallel the dull hum of militancy that permeates church culture. They want to call me a terrorist? They can call me a terrorist, but I'll tell you one thing, I'm American. I hunt pedophiles, I've been hunting them for 20 years, and they are watching this and they're salivating. They are happy that Rolling Stones and The Guardian are ripping on a movie that exposes them. Agents arrested an Arizona man who was dressed like a character from the Book of Mormon during the Capitol insurrection on January 6th. Like Captain Moroni, the early Mormon church minced no words about their intention to raise an army and fight back against oppression. 
Mormonism, it is a religion, but it's a political body. The Book of Mormon is full of politics. Early Mormonism is full of politics. Like Captain Moroni, Joseph Smith raised a militia of thousands to protect against tyrannical governments, which to him was anything that didn't give the Mormons free reign over their lands and people. Meanwhile, Smith declared himself a king in a secret meeting called the Council of Fifty. So they're fighting this uh, literal historic idea of kings, and yet, DNC 132, the entire goal of Mormonism is to become a god king. They're absolutely against kings and absolutely want to be kings, in the same way that they're absolutely against the U.S. government and they want to be the U.S. government. It wasn't until Brigham Young made it to Utah, far from the reaches of the federal government, that the church's militancy flourished. They wanted sovereignty, and they needed an army to get there. Brigham Young was using both the Gathering of Israel concept and the polygamy concept to mass import a body of civilians in order to build his empire in order to work toward overthrowing the United States. The immigration project was to build an army. Missionary work to indigenous peoples was to build an army. Just like in the Book of Mormon, this expansion into early Utah brought the Mormons the wealth they needed to grow as a population. And just like the Book of Mormon, it created trouble with the neighbors. They build a fort on that river. They start overfishing the Timpanogos' water sources, overgrazing on the grasses, turning these hunting grounds into farmlands. Timpanogos are upset. They're starving. Their people are dying from these European diseases. So they start taking cattle. Mormons decide that the appropriate response is uh, murder. Brigham Young doesn't see coexistence as a functional long-term strategy, so he orders Daniel Wells and 50 men from the Nauvoo Legion to, quote, quell and stay the operations of all hostile Indians, exterminating such as do not separate themselves from their hostile clans and sue for peace. It's not often you hear the words peace and exterminate in the same sentence, probably because genocide isn't peaceful for the people getting murdered. At least not with that attitude. Always look on the bright side of life. The extermination order starts by the militia surrounding a village of Timpanogos families at dawn, still asleep. Murder most of the people there, the survivors flee up canyon, Mormons chase them up canyon, find mostly women and children with their dead. Mormons either murder or kidnap and enslave the women and children. They decapitate at least 50 of the bodies to sell to craniologists. Talk about delight in the shedding of blood. This is the guy Mormons named BYU after. That's a bad guy. That is a raw neck. Nick also told me about how J. Reuben Clark Mormon apostle and undersecretary to U.S. President Calvin Coolidge, brought in the Monroe Doctrine to justify and reinforce the U.S.'s divine right to meddle in the affairs of South America. If you want to hear my full interview with Nick, subscribe to my Patreon. Definitely follow Unsettling Mormonism on Instagram. Anyway, while the war chapters of the Book of Mormon offer little by way of Mormon doctrine, they do crystallize its jingoism. Righteous intentions lead to righteous actions. Were they more interested in teaching people how to live righteously instead of how to think religiously, the church might invite young people to explore the ethics of war or ask why Moroni killed people who wouldn't fight for him. Instead, the church education system, CES, offers bland parallels between life and war that are a little abstract. The Nephites build fortifications, prosper, and preserve their liberties, reads one high school seminary manual section header, followed by this hypothetical. A young man was feeling tired, but didn't want to go to bed, so he began to search the internet. He found himself tempted to visit sites that contained pornographic images. Visit sites that contained pornographic images? You mean watch porn? The manual asks how the young man's choices made him susceptible to temptation, and asks what we can do to protect ourselves from Satan's grasp. To reiterate, this guy's wrong choice was not going to bed when he was sleepy. Lessons like this illustrate the paranoia of spiritual warfare, a never-ending source of stress only relieved by doing good Mormon things like prayer, scripture study, and temple attendance. Fighting the good fight is constant, 
and if we're not fighting in it, we better be preparing for it. No wonder being sleepy is dangerous. The assault on inner peace is constant. Life becomes less of an experience to enjoy and more of a challenge to endure and overcome. One where if you fail, you knowingly forfeit the unimaginable joy of a top-tier afterlife. So you're saying I can be anything? <laughs> oh yeah, that sounds way better than what I was gonna do. It makes sense that the church focuses on Amalekites at the door and king men in the city walls. Better to keep them busy with made-up threats from an all-powerful cabal than weigh in on how actual tyrants cloak themselves in the language of democracy. Our troops fought block by block to help Iraq seize the chance for a better future. They never question how a Mayan civilization from 200 AD mirrors the exact government Joseph Smith grew up with in 1830. They never ask why a system of democratically elected representatives is God's chosen government, nor do they explore the possibility of new, better ways to govern. Any kind of addiction robs you of freedom. So whether it was debt or drugs or communism or anything, he spoke against it because he felt that people needed to be free to be able to make their own choices. He felt that America was the Lord's base of operations and that it needed to be free. That was Sherry Dew talking about former church president Ezra Benson, a prophet known for his radical nationalism, ties to the John Birch Society, and short-lived presidency bid alongside racial segregationist Strom Thurmond. Not enough troops in the army to force their southern people to break down segregation and admit the into our theaters, into our spring pools, into our homes. Like Alma, Benson believed America was a choice nation given to white people by God. Like Alma, Benson saw non-whites as inferior and incapable of self-governance. And like Alma, he saw them as pawns in the devious schemes of corrupt white people like Amalekiah or Karl Marx. In a talk from October 1967, Benson said black people were, quote, merely the unfortunate group selected by professional community agitators to be the primary source of cannon fodder. Only whites think for themselves. My parents hung this guy's portrait in our house, dude. And now it's time for... The Fair, Fair Mormon, Mormon Response. Response! Remember when I warned about Mormons saying Lamanites weren't necessarily black? Check out the title of this fair article. If Lamanites were black, why didn't anyone notice? Next, Mormons themselves practice communism. In the early church, Joseph Smith commanded church members to give their land and money to the church with himself as chief steward. It was a way to make sure everybody had enough. And there is enough and to spare, the Lord says in section 104. The law of consecration, as it's called, demands total submission from church members, requiring their time, talents, strength, property, and money for the building up of the church. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Oh yeah, their wives too. But if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God, and will destroy her if she abide not in my law. I took that out of context, by the way. According to Joseph Smith, polygamy was never part of the law of consecration. And according to Joseph Smith, he never practiced polygamy. What a thing it is to be accused of having seven wives when I can only find one! Joseph Smith had at least 25 confirmed wives, by the way. The law of consecration differs from communism, the church says, because it was all voluntary. But was it really? Anyone who refused was threatened with excommunication, a loss of property, and the wrath of God. If that's voluntary... Consider me Miles Davis. It took less than a year for Mormons to do away with the communism thing, though they still teach the law of consecration in the temple today. Which, isn't that rich? A church so wealthy that it hides billions of dollars from its members still asks them to give back? Temples, by the way, are those huge white buildings you pass on the freeway. They're open only to the most upright Mormons, and only inside can you learn the secret handshakes and special passphrases needed to enter heaven. The original law of consecration was meant to create an equal society where there was, quote, no poor among them, them being church members. Today, though, the church keeps a tight grip on its $250 billion nest egg. Despite being one of the wealthiest churches in the U.S., 
Its headquarter state of Utah ranks number two in national poverty, with nearly a third of those impoverished being African American, aka cannon fodder. If a destitute family is faced with the decision of paying their tithing or eating, they should pay their tithing. The bishop can help them with their food. Meanwhile, Mormons claim to be oppressed not by economic conditions or segregationist laws, but by shows like Mormon No More, Under the Banner of Heaven, Murder Among the Mormons, and Lula Rich. Again, the church has $250 billion in reserves. In a time where inflation and wealth inequality are worse than before the Great Depression, $250 billion could go a long way in helping the poor. The church's private real estate portfolio, the largest in the country, might be able to help rehabilitate the Timpanogos peoples they genocided. I mean, it could be today, but I guess it's not our place to judge. As long as they don't just give the money away. That would be communist. So while the Lamanites are stuck with dark skin despite their darndest efforts to follow the white Nephites, wicked though they were, only the whites get a chance to govern with God's continual blessing and guidance. What a world. Well, that's it for this episode of Morning Seminary. Gotta say, I wasn't too sure I could make the war chapters interesting, but it turns out everything in the Book of Mormon is interesting if you look hard enough. That's not a compliment. What's really interesting is how this whole Tim Ballard thing panned out. If you don't know who he is, basically the Mormon church backed this guy's campaign to hunt pedophiles and make a movie about it. Except he turned out to be a fraud and a sexual predator. What's more fluid than gender? Age. The church tried to walk back their support, but doing that only made Ballard's supporters suspicious of the church. A authoritarian organization implants anti-authoritarian ideas into their structure, but what that does is it leaves openings for the leadership of the church to become the enemies. So yeah, some Mormons are resigning due to the very anti-authoritarianism the church taught them. I imagine they're feeling pretty confused right now. Until next time, adieu.